Okay, Pastor, you dragged me into this. VBS is going to start in just a couple of minutes. But you had, you had to do the recap right before we get started. So here I am. Dee, what do you think? I'm drum, I'm a drum major because it's Spark Studios for people. Well, you're going to have to fluff that thing up. You, that's as flat as a pain. Do you think I should go with it? I mean, that's that's a more drum major kind yeah, of thing. Is. But this is fun. This is probably funnier. Right? Yeah. This yeah. is the bear, the bear skin cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you, you know, know the story behind these, right? No, tell me. Yeah, well, so Tell me, tell me the story. Well, so that. at the at, at Napoleon's greatest defeat, which yeah. you know, I, I you yeah. probably know that was at the Battle of Waterloo. Yeah. yeah. The French were wearing these bearskin caps. Oh, put on my hat. And when the English defeated them, the French were running away. They were scared, as the French were wont to do. And uh, the bear, the, the caps are flying off their heads, flying off their head. They must have not had these chains. And the English picked them up, and to make fun of them, they put it on their they heads. They put it on their heads and chased them and shot them <laughs> and captured the public. Um, and so that so the British, by wearing these caps, are continually celebrating their victory over the, the cowardly. Well, British. a lot of that probably is uh, that by their wearing them today, it really, yeah. <laughs> that that was just a little joke between me and Pastor, because he told me that story right before we got on, so I can tell it back to you. Um, uh, so, yeah, I think this looks better. Um, so i I got to tell you a story. It's a little bit of a confession, because I got oh. I got called out yesterday. Oh, did you really? Yeah, so this is, so I always love to visit um, the the old women that sit towards the back of the All worship right. center. You usually get to talk to them once every couple of Sundays or what have you. Um, and one of them, Miss Jerry Tingle, and I hope she's watching right now. She's been telling me for weeks, she said, Kirkwood, now behind your back, these women are saying they don't like your hair. <laughs> but I thought you were going to say somebody was offended because you said I had a senior moment. No. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. The women don't like your hair. And she said, but I just want you to keep it up because I love it. Keep it up. <laughs> Miss <laughs> Jerry, I hope you're watching. <laughs> so yes, so yes. <laughs> Yesterday she pulls, she pulls me aside. She said, "Kirkwood, remember when I said I liked your hair? It's gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. You look like a werewolf." I don't, I don't know what, what's different about. It. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because I started parting in the middle. But the point was, I had a, I had a good moment with Miss Jerry, and, and we laughed. About you know, we we have the best senior adults. They're wonderful. Here. They're wonderful. I they love really getting are. In fact, I, I was just up at the front door, and here were senior adults coming in to work with children this week. I love it. So, we, yeah, they, they, all they are they are wonderful folks. When I got when I came to this church, which and this is true for any church, but my dad gave me some of the best advice at the beginning. He said, find who the senior adults are, the faithful, yeah. and then just go and connect with them. Because there's yeah. some people that built this church. Yeah. You know? and, so I, and so, yeah, I got to, I've gotten to know a lot of them. Um, they're, they're good friends. I really, it's been too long since I visited one of the legacy lunches. I need to go to that. Well, we got a big week ahead of us, Pastor. It's VBS week. Yeah. Spark Studios. Do you want to come and like get a... Spark Studios? Is that... Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's the... We're doing that in that. That's the VBS. That, well, yeah, so Sparks to the idea. It's like the God is created. And he's created us. The theme is Ephesians 2.10, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which right. God prepared beforehand right. that we should walk in them. Yeah. So the idea is that God is the creator. And he's yeah. created us for good works, and so we're going we're gonna to teach the kids. Yeah. Now, yeah. i got to talk. I probably that's gotta, a great thing. i got to talk to you some offline probably about... Okay. Um, Wednesday night, because I want to see if you want to get a pie in your face or something like that. This coming Wednesday? Yeah, are you going to be here? Uh, uh, yeah. Or are you uh, sick that day? No, you just no. Have a pie in your face? No. Um, we'll pray about it. <laughs> we'll see what, we'll see I'm what just happens. Give, I'm okay. just giving you our time. All right, now let me put my bearskin cap back on. Right. Because this, um, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the message yesterday. Because, Pastor, this was... Here's what I want to know. 
Yes. What what led you to this text in the first place? I don't know. All I can say is the Lord. I do. I honestly do not know. Now that you ask, how I came upon this text and why I felt so strongly pulled to preach out of it uh, on a day where we were, you know, we've been praying toward the fifty days, and I hope right. and, I hope and pray that all of my prayer partners are not going to stop praying now. Um, oh yeah, me too. So, because uh, yesterday was Pentecost, that's like yesterday was Pentecost. fifty days between Easter and Pentecost. <clears throat> that's right. Um, Church was birthed on Pentecost, Acts chapter two. I can't wear this. This is hurting my chin. It's going to be, it's going to be rough. The French do not know how to make cats look good. Uh, no, but, but you, you got led to, to the Italians. When you, that. Amen. Yeah, Armani, we saw this in the that's text. Right. Yesterday. Armani, this so, is in this text. So you sent me this on Saturday night. Because you were like, hey, this is the reading. And so I read through the whole chapter, which you preached pretty much the whole chapter because it's narrative. And, yeah. And you went through the whole thing. Um, and I'm just looking at this, like what David did, like with the giving of Saul's sons to the Gibeonites, and then they, they kill them. And um, I mean, there's there's so much here. Um, I almost don't know where to start. I think I think I'm, it's I, a very it's a very unusual chapter. And the, the thing, when you come to chapter 21 of 2 Samuel, you have to realize that really 2 Samuel kind of ends with chapter 20. And then the writer comes back and says, I'm going to give you several events that happened in David's life that I did not cover. It's almost like an appendix or something. Yeah, it's an epilogue yep. kind of deal. That uh, kind of deal. And so he comes back, and you know, in 21, he gives you this whole thing of the, the event of the Gibeonites. And then he comes down with another time that the Philistines rose up and, you know, came at Israel to have war with them. And see, uh, David goes out to fight, and one of his mighty men has to come over and help him kill this guy that he's fighting with. And they look at David and say, you shall not go out again with us to battle so that you do not extend, extinguish the land of Israel. That this episode happened later in his life. He's an older man now, and the, the guy said, "Your days of coming to war are over. You you can't do it anymore." And then you come to you know Psalm twenty two. Uh, Psalm twenty two. Second Samuel twenty two is just David's psalm of deliverance, yeah. and then his last song and his mighty men, and then the, and census. Then the census, and it ends with David building an altar. David built an altar there to the Lord, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. That's the Lord that's moved off. These are just different events. Yeah, this is not chronological. Anymore. No. He comes back and he says, oh, by the way, he said there were some times in David's life that you just need to hear about these events. And so he just puts them in there. So yesterday, you took, well, and that's really helpful as far as understanding 2 Samuel. As far as this chapter is, is uh, and we don't have time to go all the way through it, so if you missed the message yesterday, friends that are watching, make sure you listen to that, because you took a good 17 to 20 minutes just to set up what's happening here. If you don't understand that, none of this makes any sense. Well, and the thing that, that, that grabbed me the most, in, as you set it up, and I, I forget the different oh and I want I want you to talk about that numbers 35 thing in a second about the not the not murdering um, that was one thing I wanted to cover but the idea it was a Joshua chapter 9 is that where it was mm -hmm. and yeah. because the people they actually they're deceived by the giving giving nights right but the Lord's and so they they cut this covenant with the giving right. which they're not supposed to do but they cut it in God's name yes and because of that God holds them to it that's right. That you, is you, don't, you don't break a covenant that you make, you know, in the presence of God. Wedding vows. Sure. It's a covenant. You don't break those things. Uh, or God sees it as you have taken his name in vain, and he will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And so cut it, or rather uh, breaking that covenant would be ultimately taking the name of the Lord. Yes. And that's why Joshua and the leaders of Israel are so strong about that. Joshua said, we can't, we can't break it. But this is what we can do. We will make them servants right. from now on. And they will serve us by cutting wood for the tabernacle and then the temple. And they will draw water and bring water. And so for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years. That's, that's the relationship between Israel and the Gibeonites. They live alongside one another. Even right. though at the beginning God had said, Wipe them all out. Right, right. 
And then Saul comes, and he's overzealous and basically tries to go for a genocide on the Gibeonites. And, and I'll tell you where I think that comes from. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 22, <clears throat> okay, uh, tw chapter 21 and 22, really. Okay. He, uh, David is on the run from Saul. Right, I remember this, yeah. Saul is still king. David's running from him. He goes to the priests at Nob. Then David came to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet him. And David said to him, why are you alone? No one's with you. David was kind of like the head of Saul's army. He would never travel alone. Mm -hmm. He would always have soldiers with oh, him. Okay. But he comes, and that's why Ahimelech, said, he goes out there a little, what, what's wrong. going on? Something's yeah. wrong. Well, he's running from Saul. He says, I'm, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. Give me a sword. Do you have a sword here? And he said, well, I've got the sword of Goliath, you know, that you, <laughs> you took. So he said, give me that. And in there, while he's there, there is a servant of Saul's uh, by the name of Doeg the I see Edomite. Him. I see him. Okay. Old Doeg. Doeg. That's it. Okay. D-O-E-G. Yeah, and Doeg shows, he's there. He's and he sees David. Well, he goes back and he tells Saul. Oh, he's yeah. been down there. And the priest down there gave him weapons and they gave him food. And so Saul says, mount up, boys. We're going to go down there and wipe them out. And he right. goes in and he wipes out the priest. There's only one who escapes. And um, Saul was just crazy. He was he was demonically possessed. Yeah. You know, a, a spirit would come on him. Well, while he's killing the priest, uh, most likely the Gibeonites lived around the priests because they were constantly serving yes, the right, priests right, uh, in the temple. It, it was probably at that time that Saul just started slaughtering the Gibeonites. And he gets over excited killing these priests. You know, he just starts killing and it just, uh, let's kill some more. And he starts in killing the Gibeonites. So it seems like and I, I, I interpreted it this way, and I might be wrong, but, but like it's almost this twisted way where Saul's trying to earn his way back into favor of the Lord because he gives up his, you know, he's the Lord's anointed from the mm -hmm. beginning, but almost immediately because he didn't wait for Samuel to come, yeah. right, to give the sacrifice, he forfeits his anointing before the Lord. Yeah. Is there maybe some twisted way that by killing the Gibeonites, he's saying, well, no, I'm going to fulfill like originally what the Lord told us to do. Well, if you go back and you look here, it's uh, he may he could have used that as an ex as an excuse, uh, but you read in chapter twenty one of Second, Second Samuel. Samuel it says, "But Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the sons of Israel and Judah." Could be in. Could that's that's, a, that's not a bad a possible uh, reading. Yeah, it, you, we really don't know because that's all we're told in his zeal in his passion. Uh, Probably maybe to get the people to like him again. Yes. Uh, because he always had a problem with the people, you know. Yeah. A, a, a poor ruler, an ungodly ruler, an unjust ruler, an unfair ruler, uh, always is attempting to pull the people to his side because people don't like him. People don't care for him. Well, the problem, and the, his biggest problem was David because they loved David. They you did. Know, even the bards are singing, Saul's yeah. killed his yeah. thousands and David his yeah. ten thousands yeah. and that sort of thing. Um, and it infuriates Saul. I'm going to, well, and, and you and me talked one time about that book, The Tale of Three Kings. Yeah. Just that, and that's wild. Do you remember the author of that one? Yeah, Edwards, I believe his name. So that, and that's just like a little 80 page sort of, it's just, it's just this thought of like the psychology of all of that. Right. Like this king succeeding another king and the, the betrayal and all that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, what was going on inside Saul's head? Well, like you just so wisely said, well, we know what's in scripture and other than that, like you get into kind of conjecture. Yeah. Um, jumping ahead a little bit, um, you, you said you couldn't go into it yesterday, what God had said with regards to murder because yeah. you equated like this, <clears throat> David gives these seven they're called sons of Saul, but they're really sons and grandsons of Saul. David gives them over to the Gibeonites because that's what the Gibeonites asked for. You made a good argument for why this was actually a sin on David's part. Uh, in the first place, David only claims responsibility himself. 
He uses a lot of personal pronouns. I'm doing this. It's clear he's doing it really without prayer yeah. or great consideration. And then you read the text, and we say, well, well, this doesn't seem right. He's giving over these, I mean, essentially innocent people to be killed at the hands of the Gibeonites, and it's some kind of, like, twisted sacrifice that doesn't seem to fit with the character of God. And you said, no, of course it doesn't fit with the character of God. God's argued against murder. He's argued against this very kind of thing. Yeah. And I thought you said it was in Numbers, but I, I have yeah, to look at Yeah, I, I think you're here. right. I think it is in Numbers. numbers. That's what I was just thinking. I've got to look back here and see. Yeah, here it is. Numbers 35. All right. He says, moreover, you shall not take ransom for the life of murder. In other words, you can't pay off. If you murder somebody, you can't buy yourself out of it. That's simply. Uh, who is guilty of death, but he shall surely be put to death. Uh, verse 33 of Numbers 35. So you shall not pollute the land in which you are, for, for blood pollutes the land. Wow. And no expiation can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Wow. Wow. So, so the the thing was, is that uh, the Gibeonites had been slaughtered by Saul. Something has to be done. But now this is 500 years later. This is 500 years later. After. And so David's solution and the Gibeonite solution is, well, let's kill seven of seven being the number of completion. This will complete this whole thing here. And, and yet the word of God tells us that no son will be punished for the sins of the father. Now, I realize, and I know, it says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, here, the, the sins of the father will be visited down to the third and the fourth generation. That is a national thing, that when you have the, the fathers of a nation who do certain things, that then the whole people, the sons of the fathers, the leaders, will suffer because of the bad policy of the fathers. So They've gone off into sin. It's the, su it's the suffering. It's like the natural consequences of sin. Yes, not like but, an imposed execution. But, you know, you, you go out and commit, commit some great sin. We're not going to take Jude right, and say, we're going to punish you for what your daddy did. Right. God says that's not fair. And then God also says, because they leave these bodies out, that's what the pagans would do. Right. That's but right. the Hebrews were always to bury the body by sundown. Well, and that's where this servant or this concubine woman comes in. Yes. Because she's like, all right, well, these they, they died unjustly. Yeah. But I'm going to make sure that we at least fulfill the law and how we bury them. Right. And that was, and she was really pure of heart in that way. I think she was, you know, I, I, and I think it was her prayers that really is what is meant when it says after that God was moved by prayer for the land. God heard her prayer, you know, God heard, I think, David's prayer after he goes and he buries these bodies. I think, so it, it says when it was told David that Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, what she had done, she's out there caring for these bodies, keeping the animals away. Yeah. This is a horrible thing. This shouldn't be done in Israel to leave these bodies out mm -hmm. like this. And I think he gets under conviction. And he, David, went and took the bones. And in verse 13, he brought up the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan and the, the seven sons. And he buried them in the tomb of Kish. Well, I think that was a repentance on David's part. I think that's what he was expressing. So you showed us that, which which is like this woman, the concubine or prostitute woman, however you want to put it, is really the one that starts this that, that starts this transition in the heart of David. Yeah, it makes a I huge so. difference in all of Israel. Yeah. And then you did, uh, and then beautifully you showed us how, um, just in in an imperfect way, this does point to Christ mm -hmm. with people um, dying and then repenting on the outskirts of the city, and then be, you. you Go through that one more time, because I'm telling it. I'm, I'm not telling it very well. Now you got to you got to give me that again. Well, so you you talked at the end of like, hey, does does this oh, show yeah. you does this yeah. show you the story of Christ when he's yeah. taken yeah. the cross? Well, when you when you look at this thing, this woman shows up. Rizpah shows up, the daughter of Ai. She shows up and she stretches out this sackcloth. We're told over the oh, over, symbol over of spread it right. for herself on the rock. Sackcloth is always in the Old Testament a picture of repentance. Not just grief and sorrow, but repentance. 
and she spreads that out on the rock. That, that's just so symbolic to me. I'm spreading myself out in repentance before Christ, before the rock. Yeah. And she's there, and she she stays there for what appears to be about eight months. Yeah, that's the most amazing part to me is how long she's there. It's almost the same. And you think about, she has to watch these bodies decompose day by day by day, month by month by month in the broiling sun, yeah. it, you know, yeah, out I'm there scared. in how cold it gets at night, uh, uh, you know, even in the summer and cold it gets at night in the desert or up there in the mountains of, of Israel. She's out there. She keeps the animals away. They basically... The, the flesh just comes off of these bodies. It just rots off. And I talk about the unpleasantness of atonement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I can't remember who said this, that Jesus Christ did not die on a cross of gold on the communion table right. between flowers, right. uh, you know, on a Sunday morning when everything, with, with beautiful music and wonderful lighting and all of that. We, we, we so make, the act of crucifixion antiseptic when it was a horrible, nasty, stinking affair. A rough hewn cross. Yes. On a you know hot bloody. Bed. Yeah. Just, dusty. Um, between two, not between two flowers, but between two thieves. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then the and then of course the the sky going dark, all this. Yeah. But that was the cost of our redemption. Yeah, that that's right. That shows us how awful our sin actually that's is. That's exactly. She sits there through that, and it's just the perfect picture to me. These men died for the sins of Saul. Mm -hmm. Christ died for the sins of men. Um, his mother was there. She was a mother of two of these boys. Um, you know, uh, David comes, a noble man. The king comes and takes the bodies down and buries them. The two noble men that came, you know, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who come and take the body of Jesus and bury him. You know, this was north of Jerusalem. Uh, Calvary is north of Jerusalem. It's a rock just north of, just outside the gates of Jerusalem. But I think the point is, and I know you said this yesterday, the point is these guys died for the sins of Saul. Yeah. But that isn't what stops the famine. No, the it's not. It was not. It was, I think, the repentance. It's the repentance right. that brought, that stayed the Lord's hand, and then finally he moved and right. set the rain right. down. Yeah, so that, I think that's so important, that distinction. This points to the sacrifice of Christ, but you, know, you can't equate it with the sacrifice of Christ. You see, God was not moved. No, it's just a, a foreshadowing. Right. It gives right. you somewhat of a picture. He, it, the thing is this, is that, the Gibeonites executing these guys, these guys hanging there in a public place for people to see. All of these things do not bring about the blessing of God. And rain is always seen, I didn't say this, but rain is always seen as the blessing That's of true. God. That's yeah. true, uh, I, I go to Israel about every other year. I'll be there this coming year in March. That's the end of the latter. I get there almost every year about the time. It'll rain about the first day that I'm there, and then it just kind of the sun comes out, and it ends the rainy season. season. <clears throat> Even today, the, the Hebrews there will tell you the rain is the blessing of God. Uh, they desperately need it. If they don't get it, they don't, they don't have anything to eat. Well, listen to what it says. After that, after all of this stuff happens, God was moved, not by the execution, not by this, not by that. He was moved by the prayer for the land. It was prayer. Amen. It was the prayer. So it sounds like we need to recommit then to, to prayer going forward, and we'll ask the Lord to continue to send yeah. revival. Yeah. 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 We'll continue to ask. Yeah. All right. Well, speaking of revival, we got uh, BBS ahead of us, and uh, I'm going to teach the kids about Ephesians 2.10 while wearing this drum major outfit. In about 20, 25 minutes. Yeah, I better get going. All right. Well, here's a, here's a kick for you guys. Starting the week off.